Hi, and welcome to another video in aerodynamics. Up until this point, we have covered the basics of compressible flow, where we studied conservation of mass, momentum, and energy without the common constant density assumption, and combined our typical fluid mechanics analysis with thermodynamics to deal with the more energetic flows. We have also covered why shocks are generated and what happens to flow downstream of a normal shock wave. The flow rapidly sees a decrease in speed and Mach number, and as a consequence an increase in the pressure, temperature, and density. Then the shocks were angled into oblique shocks, which we see when the flow closes in on itself, and an expansion fan, which we see when the flow opens up. All of these are the basic principles of high-speed aerodynamics for supersonic flows. However, when you increase your velocity enough, you enter a new regime of flow called hypersonics. At this point, the flow has so much energy that the basic rules of thermodynamics and perfect gases no longer apply, and the flow starts to change at a molecular and even atomic level. These changes lead to interesting chemical and physical differences in our analysis, all of which we'll cover today. So, let's jump in. Generally, as humans, we like to take engineering to the extreme. We want vehicles to travel farther, faster, and more efficiently. As a result, the hypersonic flow regime is a very attainable and realistic environment for a vehicle. When going to space, you inherently go through such low-density fluid that you delve into hypersonic flows on exit and re-entry. Generally, missiles and ballistics become active when they get to their target faster and with more energy, so we're constantly pushing the boundaries on their Mach number capabilities. Finally, even passenger travel is eyeing hypersonic flows with the possibility of carrying passengers from point A to point B faster than ever thought possible. All of these have one thing in common, hypersonics, meaning they need special design considerations and analysis to be effective. Hypersonics is the fuzzy boundary of vehicle speed at which point you're going so fast our main analysis techniques for fluid mechanics and thermodynamics break entirely. I like to think of hypersonics as being a combination of fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, and chemistry. A good rule of thumb is that flow past Mach 5 is hypersonic, but it has a lot of wiggle room. It's better to understand the chemical processes that happen when you keep adding energy to a gas to see why there's no clear cutoff for hypersonics. So first, we consider the chemistry. We typically view air as a continuous, perfect gas. But air is made up of a bunch of molecules that are all bouncing around. Statistically, air is 78% N2, a diatomic pair of nitrogen atoms, and 21% O2, a diatomic pair of oxygen atoms. Now, air can have kinetic energy due to the bulk motion of the molecules in a single direction, and internal energy due to the internal molecules bouncing all over the place with their own independent velocities. For most slow flows, the internal energy is far greater than the kinetic energy. When we first studied compressible flow, we talked about how at some point you have so much kinetic energy that it becomes meaningful to the internal energy of the fluid. And when air moves very fast and hits a vehicle, a lot of it slows down dramatically, leading to a bunch of the kinetic energy becoming the internal energy. That is how we mark the cutoff for when flow becomes compressible, when the kinetic energy can meaningfully change the internal energy. Now we consider what happens when the kinetic energy gets so high that it has the capability to mess with molecular and even atomic structure. This all happens in stages of increasing energy. The first stage is the most familiar. Flow can be compressible, but behaves like an ideal gas. This means we can use a lot of our thermodynamics tools we've learned. As we go faster, we add kinetic energy. At some point, we still have an ideal gas, meaning no interparticle interaction, but the gas gets a second temperature. This sounds crazy, because it is. In a typical setting, gas molecules bounce around, bump into one another, and do their thing. This has translational energy that is related to the temperature of the fluid. But as the temperature of the flow gets higher and higher, you start to see a second type of energetic motion, 
diatomic molecules, like the ones in air, start to vibrate. Instead of moving like rigid dumbbells, each individual atom moves relative to its pair. This is called vibrational energy and is not captured by only a single temperature. Now, let's consider more velocity so things heat up even more. At some point, there's so much energy in the molecule itself that it completely dissociates. Dissociation means the two atoms decide they're better off separate and they go their own way. Our diatomic molecule, like O2, breaks into two individual oxygen atoms. This break takes energy and it dramatically changes the gas behavior. And now we see why it's tough to set a single cutoff for hypersonic flow. We have a lot of both O2 and N2 in air, and they behave differently. O2 dissociates into two oxygen atoms at around 2000 Kelvin, but N2 dissociates at around 4000 Kelvin. Both of these temperatures limits occur at different velocities, so we get a regime where O2 is breaking, but the N2 is not. So the hypersonics regime is really more of a gradual process with many sub-regimes. Moving on, let's add even more velocity. At this point, we're dealing with isolated atoms bouncing around all over the place, and now we're continuing to pump energy into those atoms. And if you add enough energy, you reach ionized gases, which means now the electrons start to do their own thing. Ionized gas is also called a plasma, and is the fourth state of matter after solid, liquid, and gas. Consider an oxygen molecule, which typically has eight protons, eight neutrons, and eight electrons. And we've added enough internal energy that one of the electrons feels comfortable leaving the atom entirely and going on its own. This is called a free electron. This means our gas now starts to gain an electrical charge, and as you can imagine, does all sorts of weird things to our heat transfer and flow mechanics. And if we were to keep adding energy to our flow, we would reach a regime where things are incredibly hot and heat transfer is dominated by radiative heating instead of conductive heating. And this represents the extreme of hypersonics, at least currently to our knowledge. So basically, as the vehicle continues to speed up, the gas effects go from macroscopic to molecular and even down to the atomic level. But enough about the chemistry. What happens physically to the vehicle if we zoom out? What's so different about hypersonics? Let's go over a few meaningful physical flow features. First, at hypersonic speeds, we get very shallow shock angles that are referred to as thin shock layers. Consider a regular supersonic oblique shock at Mach 2 on a wedge. The shock angles are steep and far from the boundary. At faster velocities, though, the shock angle becomes shallower or closer to the wall. Why is this? And that's a fair question. Before the shock, we have a gas condition with a Mach number, velocity, temperature, pressure, and density. After the shock, we have a different set of those same variables. The shock causes the flow to abruptly slow down, which spikes the temperature, pressure, and density. We still have conservation of mass, even in hypersonic flow, and we know that the mass into the shock has to be equal to the mass out of the shock. Also, let's recognize that higher density gas takes up less space. So, the shock pushes towards the wall because it doesn't need as much area behind it. We saw this previously when we first studied oblique shocks. The Mach angle equation tells us that the Mach angle, mu, decreases with increasing Mach number, which asymptotes to zero limit. So, higher Mach numbers mean shocks closer to the wall, and hypersonics means very high Mach numbers. Near the wall, we have other things to worry about as well. The wall has the no-slip condition, which means there's a boundary layer and the flow of viscosity becomes important. Throughout the majority of aerodynamics, we tend to ignore the viscosity and analyze things as potential flow, but we can't here. Recall the boundary layer has a height that grows as it develops along the boundary. It has been shown for compressible flow that the boundary layer growth goes as the Mach number squared divided by the square root of the Reynolds number.
going to higher Mach numbers dramatically increases the thickness of the boundary layer. This thick boundary layer leads to a number of interesting effects. There's a lot more viscous heating because there's more kinetic energy being turned into internal energy within the boundary layer. Secondly, the boundary layer effectively changes the shape of the vehicle. Now flow bends around the vehicle and around the boundary layer, which can change flow patterns and dynamics. This then leads to something called the induced pressure gradient. In boundary layer growth, we consider the pressure to be uniform along the plate for slow flows. However, for these fast flows, the growth of the boundary layer is so rapid that we get a pressure that varies along the streamwise direction, resulting in a net force due to the difference in pressure. This can lead to higher drag and unpredicted forcing. And finally, we get shock boundary layer interaction. We learned above that the shock gets very close to the wall, and now we also see the boundary layer gets very big. Often, this means the shock exists within the boundary layer, introducing shock oscillations, feedback, and general unpredictability that torments hypersonic vehicle designers. And if that wasn't enough, we get a third layer to worry about. Entropy layers also grow in a boundary layer. A quick reminder, entropy is the thermal energy unavailable for mechanical work and is often associated with disordered motion in gas. Past the shock, we see changes in entropy. Consider the front of our wedge. Even though we've done our best to make it a sharp leading edge, at some level there is curvature and roundness to it. And that means that the shock is slightly detached as a bow shock near the nose, with rapid curvature. At the very front, the flow sees effectively a normal shock. However, a little up or down from this point, and the shock becomes more of an oblique shock with a rapidly shallowing angle the further we get from the center line. A normal shock will have a different effect on the flow velocity and temperature than an oblique shock will. This leads to very strong gradients of velocity and temperature, and these gradients lead to gradients of entropy. And thus we get what's called an entropy layer, meaning a thin layer where changes in entropy are meaningful. This entropy layer firstly leads to even more heating, as if we weren't getting enough heat from everything else. It also leads to a generation of interesting vorticity and vortex structure through instabilities like the Gortler vortices. So, in hypersonic flows, we have our velocity boundary layer, our thin shock layer, and an entropy layer to worry about, all of which interact in complicated ways. Finally, we should consider the special scenario where we are hypersonic because of the high altitude, not necessarily because of high speed. High altitudes lead to lower gas density, and vehicles that enter and leave our atmosphere pass through extremely thin gas to get there. Normally in our analysis, air is continuous. Tons of molecules in a tight space mean we can consider the gas as a blob of moving stuff. However, decrease the density enough and our air becomes a vast amount of empty space with a few molecules in it. Aerodynamics generally relies on the continuous assumption for things like Navier-Stokes equations, continuity, etc. However, if you get individualized molecules, you need new theories entirely. For this, we use kinetic theory, which approaches the physics from an individual particle perspective instead of a continuous fluid perspective. Now, how do we tell if we can make the continuous assumption or not? To do this, we use the non-dimensional number called the Knudsen number, which is a ratio of the mean free path of the gas, kind of like how far apart molecules are, and the length scale of our vehicle moving through the fluid. When the Knudsen number is equal to one, there are only a few molecules in the vicinity of our vehicle. Our cutoff for the continuous assumption is usually taken to be about 0 0.03. Anything larger and kinetic theory is needed for analysis. Okay, we've considered the chemical and physical implications of hypersonic flow. Let's consider the application. In practice, hypersonics is an extreme challenge for aerodynamics engineers and leads to pretty unique designs. High lift to drag ratios are extremely tough to achieve with hypersonic flows due to the increasing shock wave drag. 
As a result, we've tried to come up with clever designs like the Wave Rider that also use shocks to try to produce lift so that we can combat this drag increase. Also, we've learned that hypersonics leads to incredibly high gas temperatures and our surfaces need to withstand things like plasma. This has led us to develop ultra-high temperature ceramics, refractory metals that are extremely temperature resilient, and even specialty composite materials that are specifically designed to ablate or shed material and reduce heat transfer to the vehicle. Finally, in hypersonics designs, you'll rarely see an exposed engine structure. Take this super simple engine schematic. The engine performance relies on the flow going into the engine, so it can change what goes out. In hypersonics, the engines are very sensitive to inlet conditions, and designers want very controlled, predictable scenarios. So we typically embed the engine into the body, where at this point the vehicle hopefully develops a very controlled shock structure so that the engine sees repeatable and predictable conditions. Clearly, designing hypersonic vehicles is an extreme of our engineering capability and requires a lot of expertise, time, and resources. And that's it. Let's review. We started by defining hypersonics as this regime of high-speed aerodynamics that generally happens around Mach 5, though the boundary is a bit fuzzy. At this point, the flow has so much energy we need to consider gas chemistry. With increasing flow speed and temperature, we start to add vibrational energy to molecules, we can split the molecules apart entirely, and even start to change the atomic structure of the gas itself through ionization. From a zoomed out perspective, we see thin shock layers due to the high Mach number pushing down the shock angle. The boundary layer becomes much thicker and important in consideration in design and flow mechanics leading to heating, more drag, and shock boundary layer interaction. A third layer is introduced through entropy layer, where we now have a small layer near the wall with a strong temperature gradient. Finally, in high-altitude, low-density flows, we need to consider the Newton number to determine if our continuous assumption is broken. This leads to large differences in vehicle design compared to subsonic and supersonic travel, with the invention of vehicles like the Wave Rider, high-temperature materials, and vehicle designs that create very predictable and controlled shock structure. All in all, hypersonics represents one of the most challenging, thought-provoking, and exciting areas of aerodynamics. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.